quick introduction. I know hardly anybody says they care about helicopters, but as God is my witness, I'm going to change that. If I can reach one of you airplane-obsessed uh, folks, uh, I will do my best. OK, so what is cool about a helicopter? Um, here, it's the view. So let's start. First and foremost, it's a view. So these are some pictures that uh, I snapped on a trip from the Robinson factory in Los Angeles back to uh, Boston. Who recognizes the city in the middle? Ooh, some Midwesterners here. Chicago, indeed. All right. Of course, this is the Status Center, where we will be tomorrow. Remember that. 32-141. All right. <clears throat> what are the parts of the helicopter? Uh, if you're between ages 3 and 5, it's acceptable to call the thing on the top the propeller. But older than that, it's better to say main rotor system. Uh, tail rotor is in the back. We'll talk about why we need that in a minute. Um, you got to have uh, transmissions in helicopters. The speed of the engine is never the speed that you want, I don't think. And uh, landing gear is kind of nice. Although for record setting flights, sometimes people have taken them off to try to get a little higher or a little faster. And they just land very gently. Um, OK. So, your typical helicopter drivetrain will have transmissions uh, in both, for both the main rotor and they'll have another transmission to uh, adjust the speed of the tail, maybe gear it back up a little bit. Uh, this unfortunately does introduce another source of unreliability. So in the airplane, you know, you've got your engine, it's bolted to the propeller. As long as the engine's turning, you really, it's hard to have a problem. The propellers don't generally just come apart in flight. But here with the helicopter, you might have a working engine and a working main rotor, and the transmission, all the oil might come out and the gears seize up. So you've got a, uh, there's a couple warning lights in there for when you're having a transmission problem. Um, this is uh, the rubber belt system that's used in uh, some piston helicopters. I think this is probably a drawing off of a Robinson, but basically you have uh, pulleys on the engine side and on the drivetrain side, and you have these rubber belts connecting them. So you can start your engine with the belts loose and then tighten them up when you want the engine to uh, begin driving the rotor system. That way you don't have to have the little starter motor actually turn all the rotors and stuff. All right, how does it work? So uh, Tina is a hard act to follow with my uh, cave person, computer programmer's understanding of lift. but. Uh, if you assume that uh, lift is a combination of uh, Newton's third law and the Bernoulli principle, that the sped up air has more kinetic energy, therefore it has to have, for conservation of energy, it has to have less of something else. It's going to have lower static pressure. Uh, so here's one of the FAA's diagrams here, right? We have velocity and pressure that are equal. They go into the venturi, the velocity is higher. The pressure is lower, so the energy of the air is still the same. And it comes out again at the same velocity and pressure. So you're getting lift from the wing um, from both Newton's third law, just pushing air down, makes the wing go up, and the Bernoulli principle of generating some low pressure. Uh, this is the same drawing you saw earlier of how when you exceed a certain critical angle of attack, depending on the airfoil, uh, your, lift, your lift party comes to a quick end. Um, it doesn't go away completely, but it's a sudden drop. Um, angle of attack. So remember, there's your chord line. There's your relative wind. A four degree angle of attack and a reasonable amount of forward speed. Remember, the lift varies as the speed squared. Uh, we'll have you going. And if you want to fly slowly, you just go to higher and higher angles of attack. So um, why not hover in your Cessna 172 and save yourself the trouble of getting a helicopter rating? It's because you know, off the right end of this chart, you quickly get to the stalling angle of attack, and the plane doesn't fly anymore. So uh, there's an FAA drawing, I think, from the pilot's handbook. Uh, where the airflow becomes turbulent uh, somewhere between 12 and 16 degrees angle of attack, depending on the airfoil. And that's why uh, the Cessna can't be used for hovering operations. 
all right, what if you saw the wing off the Cessna and spin it around? So if you do that, the wing will always have airspeed even if the fuselage is not moving. And that was an idea that was first reduced to practice in 1907. So only four years after the Wright brothers flew, uh, a couple guys in uh, France were actually hovering a little bit in a helicopter. The first helicopters that could be flown and controlled and you know, actually operated uh, as you know, a practical aircraft, uh, I think you know, mid-30s in Germany. Um, and then Sikorsky uh, is famous for being the uh, first mass producer of helicopters with the Sikorsky uh, R4. It, it was briefly, it was used for a few operational uh, purposes in uh, World War II search and rescue type stuff. Uh, but really, you know, Korea, the Korean War was the first time that helicopters were widely used by the military. All right, let's talk about uh, very simple qualitative physics here. Uh, we're spinning on the ramp and we're hovering. Uh, we're sorry, we're spinning on the ramp. So we spin the uh, rotor system up to 400 RPM, but we're still on the ramp. So. Does anybody have a brilliant idea for how do we get up into the air where we want to be? If we're not going to increase the RPM, change the pitch of the um, main rotor system. OK, excellent. So uh, what's your name? Sorry. Aziz. Aziz has the uh, correct observation that if you want to get the same lift out of a wing um, without changing the speed, uh, we don't want to have this. We don't want to speed up too much because the tips will go supersonic and the neighbors will begin to complain. So we just twist the uh, blades up a little bit, and as they're twisted up, they'll bite more air, generate more lift, and the helicopter will begin rising up. Uh, what will happen to the speed? Let's hear from one of these uh, aero engineering heroes. As we generate more lift, what happens? Uh, you now have more drag on the rotors, so the engines slow down. More lift. More drag. So without adding more power, the engine, uh, uh, the, well, without adding more power, the blades will slow down. So you want a correlator. As you're lifting the uh, collective control on a helicopter, the correlator is opening the throttle and adding more power uh, automatically. And there's also an electronic governor that will just touch that up a little bit by watching the RPM. Uh, turbine helicopters all have. Uh, governors, most piston, well, Robinsons have governors as well. Um, all right, so what if we are parked on ice? Has anybody here seen my favorite movie, Blades of Glory? <laughs> so when Will Ferrell and his partner, what if they're on the ice and they push each other, what happens? Both go backwards, right? The pusher and the pushy. So, Keeping in mind Blades of Glory, an important physics work. What if we're parked on the ice? What happens to our helicopter after we start the engine and start the blades spinning? Helicopter spins the other way. Excellent. Yeah, so that's Newton's third law once again, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You're not going to see that as dramatically if you're parked on pavement because of the friction. So what do we do? We, oh, we add the tail rotor. So yeah, here are the forces up here. There's the blade rotation. There's the torque. To counteract the torque, we've got the tail rotor thrust to blow the tail back into position. And the only thing here that's not corrected, you'll notice, is the tail rotor thrust. So if you set everything up the way you would think obvious, like put the rotor mass straight up and put the tail rotor on it, the whole helicopter with the controls neutral would uh, drift uh, to the right from the tail rotor uh, thrust. So, right, because it's pushing the tail. The helicopter wants to rotate. The helicopter wants to rotate that way. The tail rotor blows it back this way, and that would blow the whole machine uh, off the side of the ramp if the pilot didn't hold a lot of uh, left um, cyclic. So, to counteract that, the helicopters are rigged with the mast at a slight left angle so that uh, they don't have this tendency to uh, go off to the uh, right. Interesting question. What's huh. it, what does the governor do? The governor, OK, yeah. So let me reinforce that. So yes, add your, as you generate lift, you get more drag, which will cause the blades to slow down. So there's a mechanical correlation. 
as you're raising the uh, collective, uh, the throttle's being opened just kind of blindly, and the governor is touching that up. The governor is watching and maybe twisting the throttle control slightly to fine tune the throttle to keep the blades exactly at 400 RPM. Let's say that's the 100. For a pilot, pilots are, you know, you don't want to distract the pilot too much, so the gauge is just calibrated in percent. It's 100% RPM, that's good. That's all you need to know about your helicopter. It, you know, I think in the Robinson it works out to pretty close to 400 RPM. All right, forward flight. So we're hovering and we want to go forward. So it seems obvious that we want to tilt the fan, right? We want to push the fan down this way and that way we'll get some uh, horizontal vector of thrust and we'll be going forward. But where do we push it from, right? From according to, it's a spinning gyro, so it has a lot of stability. If we're really strong and we reach up from our pilot seat and try to nudge the rotor system, why wouldn't that just cause the helicopter fuselage to uh, move underneath the fixed rotor system instead of moving the rotor system? There's nothing to fix unless we can call up, you know, an incredibly strong friend and say, hey, would you mind holding the helicopter in a fixed position? We don't have anything to push against in order to tilt the rotor. Does that make sense? You got this gyro on top of you and disturbing it is gonna take a lot of power. And even if you had the strength, you don't have anywhere to stand rigidly and push. So what do you think? Could the rotor just fly itself into a new position? And how would that work? Like how could you use the spinning wing itself to fly itself into a new tilted down position. Anybody have any brilliant ideas? You increase the angle of attack to the blades on one side to produce more left on that side. What's your name, sorry? John. John has a good idea. So John says increase the angle of attack and decrease it as the blade moves around the disc. So if you can increase the lift on part of the disc compared to another part of the disc, it will naturally tilt itself. So if you want to go forward, let's ignore gyroscopic precession uh, for a moment, because I think we've proven that nobody understands it. Uh, <laughs> let's just say that we can make the angle of attack higher on the back of the disc compared to the front. Then the back of the disc would have more lift. It would rise, rise up, and the uh, front would go lower. And then you would see this flight path that you do see. That make sense? So basically you're controlling, you're basically flying the rotor system, you're not flying the helicopter. The helicopter's just hanging from the rotor system. That's a good uh, mental model. And all the power is uh, you know, from the engine to the rotor system, so that's a natural place to do it, just by tweaking the blade angle as it rotates around. So left hand is collective, moving the blades uh, angle regardless of where they are uh, on the disc. Um, and the cyclic, which is changing the pitch cyclically, as is suggested. All right, what's the magic? Uh, this design, I'm not sure it's really changed at all since the very first helicopters. Maybe those brothers in Paris uh, didn't have one in 1907, but I'm pretty sure that uh, every helicopter since then has had this. There's a swash plate. Um, oh, watch this. Uh, so the lower part of the swash plate here is fixed and connected to the flight controls. And then there's a bearing and the upper swash plate rotates with the blades. Does that make sense? So if you lift the lower swash plate up, that pushes the upper swash plate up, which pushes these um, rods that are connected to a corner of the blade and that'll cause the blades to tilt. That makes sense? So you have this rotating swash plate that's connected to a corner of the blade. And you, if you push the whole thing up by yanking up on the collective, then you can see the blades actually twist. You can do that in the hanger and see the effect of this. At the same time, uh, in your right hand is the uh, cyclic. And with the cyclic, you're tilting the swash plate. So with a tilted swash plate, that will just cause the blades to tilt up uh, sorry, the, it'll cause the blades to twist up and twist down as they rotate. So it's a pretty elegant uh, solution. This is not carrying much of the load of the helicopter. You know, there's still a mast holding the whole thing up. This is really just 
uh, has to carry enough force to uh, twist the blades up and down, up and down, up and down. So that's your engineering design. Everybody appreciates that? OK. Uh, do we want to take off straight up, like in a Hollywood movie? Well, if you have one or two people in a helicopter design for four or five, uh, that you actually do have enough power to do that. However, there's something over here on the right called the height velocity diagram. Uh, and you can see it says, avoid operation in shaded areas. So they're saying, we'll talk about this um, maybe a little later if people are interested. Um, but if you are, let's say, up at uh, 200 feet uh, at zero airspeed, so you're just parked hovering 200 feet above the ground, you don't have huge stores of uh, forward speed, uh, which is a kinetic energy, or potential energy, because you're only up 200 feet. So it's going to be hard to do an auto rotation that's perfect and doesn't bend anything, especially because the FAA says if you're up high like that and the engine quits, in test piloting, you have to sit there with your uh, arms folded for one second and do nothing because that's what would probably happen in real life. You know, you'd be surprised. Uh, people can do auto rotations from 200 feet and land perfectly, but they know it's coming. They chop the throttle themselves. They immediately put the collective down, and they do the auto rotation. So, but basically, if you're a pilot of average skill and you don't do anything for about a second after the engine quits, uh, then this is supposed to keep you safe. By you either fly. Uh, 50 knots or faster, or you fly you know, 400 feet or higher at sea level and higher than that at uh, high altitude. Um, all right, so what we're actually recommended to do, see this recommended takeoff profile, is skim along the ground until we get up to about 45 knots and then let the helicopter climb. I think this is the curve for a Robinson R44. Why would you want to do that aside from safety? Well, another good reason to do that is you watch these um, drag versus speed curves, and you see that you reach kind of a minimum. Uh, this, is, this is some generic helicopter from an FAA book. It's actually 55 knots for the Robinson. But if you can go 55 knots, you need less energy than any other airspeed. So the idea for a takeoff is you nudge the helicopter forward a little bit. If you can build up two knots of speed, that gives you excess power. You can use that excess power to climb up three inches, or you can use that excess power to accelerate maybe to three or four knots. And if you just keep accelerating, using your extra power to accelerate, the faster you go, the less power you need. So even if you've never touched the collective or drawn any more horsepower, as long as you have an open area in front of you, you'll accelerate. And once you hit 45 or 55 knots, you now have your hover power turns into significant excess power that you can use for a climb. So uh, that's why you often see helicopters at airports taking off kind of like a short field airplane and also landing a bit like a short field airplane. All right, straight and level, it's very similar to an air, airplane. The uh, performance is, all, is a function of the attitude that the aircraft is in. Is it pitched up or down? And uh, how much power is uh, being applied? And that's an indirect function of the collective position. So. Uh, as with uh, an airplane, uh, remember your pitch controls your speed and the amount of power, throttle in the airplane, collective in the helicopter, determines whether you're climbing or descending at that airspeed. Uh, your attitude indicator in a VFR helicopter is the horizon. So you're watching the horizon carefully. The reason why people, people who are instrument rated airplane pilots, they jump into the helicopter and they can fly it immediately. Uh, and people who've never flown have a tough time. It takes them you know, 10 hours. And the reason is that people who are instrument rated airplane pilots, they become very sensitive to watching for small changes in uh, attitude. All right, the uh, anti-torque pedals. Um, remember, we had that tail rotor, and we adjust it so that the tail uh, doesn't uh, spin around on the ground. In the air, we adjust it so that uh, the helicopter is streamlined into the wind. Uh, we don't actually have to use them to uh, make turns. There's no adverse yaw, as in some airplanes, where it'll start skidding, or uh, there's none of that. So basically, uh, or slipping. 
All we do is to make a turn is we put the helicopter using the cyclic into a little bit of a bank, and then we wait. So if we have, you know, let's say, a 10 degree bank, uh, the helicopter in uh, one minute will uh, make a uh, 180 degree turn. Uh, landing with power. So again, like an airplane, if uh, you see the spot in the ground, you adjust the power so you don't f overfly the spot or underfly the spot. If the spot's rising up in the windshield from your perspective, that means you're going to land short, so you add power, raise collective in the helicopter. If the spot is descending, then you're overflying the spot, so you have to reduce power. It's a purely physical, it's a purely visual maneuver, um, except when you're landing on a pinnacle. And the reason for that is if you're landing on a pinnacle, you don't get a sensation of your forward speed from the ground rushing by. So the, ideal, the idea in the helicopter is to land, unlike with the airplane, it's actually a little bit, it's a little bit less unnerving than an airplane. Some people get a little bit uh, ground shy in the airplane. Like they're happy flying 80 knots in the pattern, but they're not that happy flying 70 knots you know, 10 feet above the runway, which makes sense because you don't want to slam into the ground going really fast. Well, the good news is in the helicopter, you never get to that phase where you're going fast close to the ground because when you're landing, you just say, uh, you know, how in my peripheral vision, how fast is the ground rushing by? And you just kind of keep that constant. Whatever it was up at 500 feet above the ground, that's what you want when you're five feet above the ground. And you'll very naturally slow down. You'll do the right, your natural instinct to slow down as the ground begins rushing is uh, a helpful one in the helicopter. So your peripheral vision is used for speed reference and the spot moving up or down is used for a um, descent rate reference. And that's, uh, you never have to look inside of the gauges except when you're landing on top of an office building or something. All right, can you land the helicopter without power? Um, it turns out the answer is yes. You have these three buckets of energy that I alluded to earlier. Kinetic from your forward airspeed, potential from being up high, and then another form of kinetic which we'll call blade inertia from the relatively heavy blades spinning. So raise your hand if you think the forward airspeed is number one in terms of size. Let's rank these. What's, what's the biggest? Airspeed, going a heavy helicopter going uh, 100 knots. Potential energy, a helicopter having been lifted off the, off the ground, uh, or the blades uh, whipping around near the speed of sound. Uh, okay, who votes for one? Forward airspeed, a few. Who votes for potential? A fair number. Who votes for blade inertia, the blades whipping around? All right, good, we've got a good distribution. Okay, well let me give you, I'll tell you about, uh, I think it was a crazy French guy uh, who got into a, what's now called a Eurocopter, an Alouette, and went up to 40,000 feet to set an altitude record. The record was set when the engines flamed out, that's why it's you know, 40,000 and change, not 41,000 and change. And then auto-rotated all the way down to the ground. So whatever energy bucket that was there had to be sufficient to make it all the way to the ground. So what does that tell you the biggest one is? It's got to be something that scales up to 40,000 feet. Potential. potential. Yeah, so potential energy is a good candidate for the biggest because, again, if you, you know, you got to keep the rotor spinning for longer if you're auto-rotating from 10,000 feet or 50,000 feet or wherever. Uh, I don't think that record's been broken, actually. It was set in the 70s. Uh, Okay, so number two is the forward airspeed of the helicopter. The blade inertia isn't good for much, except for cushioning your fall from five or 10 feet above the ground. So what you do in the helicopter, if the engine were to fail, uh, number one reason is fuel starvation from failing to top it off. Helicopters are often short on payload, so people uh, will say, well, I wanna take these seven people uh, somewhere, and uh, I'd be overweight if I filled the fuel tank, so I'll put in you know, half an hour of fuel for this 15 minute trip. Uh, actually, that would be illegal. 20 minutes is the minimum reserve. So I'll put in half an hour of fuel for this 10 minute trip, but then, you know, there's a bit of a delay and uh, you run out of fuel. There's a warning light at 10 minutes. All right, and the good news is you can land in a field, you know, baseball field pretty easily. All right, so 
the engine quits for whatever reason, let's say you've run out of fuel, uh, you want to get to uh, 60 or 70 knots, some reasonable airspeed, and then the challenge is to hold that airspeed, even as the ground is rushing up at you. You hold it right till you're at treetop height, about 40 feet above the ground, then you begin to flare, just like in an airplane, flaring for landing, you scrub off that forward speed, and that reduces your descent rate. So you can reduce your descent rate to zero by bleeding off all of that energy from the forward airspeed. And the kinetic energy, remember, is mv squared. So it's very important. There's twice as much energy at 70 knots compared to 50 knots. Uh, so once you've scrubbed off all your descent rate and all your forward speed, you're like this. So your tail is really low, and now you're going to just fall to the ground and hit the tail first. So it's not going to be an FAA quality. You're going to walk away, but it's not going to be an FAA quality landing. So what you can do is stick forward and settle uh, by pulling up on the collective. So you stick forward to level the skids, and then when you're about five feet above the ground, or maybe two feet above the ground, you start pulling up on the collective to cushion your fall for that last few feet. So you've used up potential energy, keeping the blades windmilling. If you just flatten the collective, uh, the blades will have a relatively normal angle of attack to the air that's now coming from below. Uh, you've kept up your forward speed and you bleed that off at the end to uh, reduce your um, vertical speed. And then finally, uh, you go. What's the cheat? And, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm telling you the cheat is you can hear it. You could hear the cheating going on. He, he landed with zero forward airspeed. Why? What enabled that? And like I said, you could hear it. Uh, it's not from the engine running. The engine was presumably at idle. OK, so what was the cheat? Nobody hurt? Wind, exactly, yes. What's your name? Messen. Messen. Messen figured this out. So basically, he landed with probably, it's very hard to kill all of your vertical speed and all of your forward speed. So if you go out and it's 15 knots down the runway, you can just get down to 15 knots. And instead of sliding and going down the runway, which is uh, common and not, not harmful to the helicopter, you'll have a perfect. Uh, what looks like a perfect uh, landing. It's very hard. In the big helicopters, like a Huey or something, it's practical to do a zero zero landing out of an auto all the time. In a Robinson, uh, it, it can be tough, but the wind helps hugely. And the, like I said, the throttle is down at idle, so the engine's not really doing anything. Question? The tail rotor is still spinning. Is auto rotating the main rotor driving the tail rotor? It is, yes. Uh, great, great question. So there's a Sprague clutch which prevents the uh, rotor system from trying to drive the um, uh, engine, because that would uh, introduce a lot more uh, drag. Uh, but the, uh, the main rotor and the tail rotor are uh, yoked together, so you still have tail rotor control. Great question. Because you don't really need you don't have a torque anymore. So. Yeah, you don't need much. I don't know. Uh, I have to think about why it's useful. Wasting energy. Yeah, it's not useful for much, that's for sure. Uh, one thing that is good about it is the hydraulic pump is also geared into the transmission, so you still have hydraulic boost, even if you're auto-rotating from super high. What can you do with a helicopter if you have a private? You can uh, visit schools. I visited the uh, Winchester Public Schools. I'm not sure you can give them all rides if you only have a private. There's some kind of, like I said, there's those charity laws that, regulations that we don't really worry about because, you know, we have commercial certificate and a letter of authority from the FISDO. But here's the here's one of the East Coast Aero Club helicopters. I flew to the public schools in Winchester's. I gave all the kids rides, and uh, when we flew over uh, houses like this, I said, "Oh, that's just like the house where I grew up." <laughs> If you do that with kids from Weston and Lincoln, they believe you. They don't uh, parse that as an ironic statement. 
All right, helicopter pilot careers, just in case any of you guys are thinking about leaving the uh, desk world. People will work as a flight instructor, fly tours in the Grand Canyon or Alaska, and then they'll either go to offshore oil uh, or Medivac after that. Um, usually offshore oil used to be easier to get. Um, when, oil, when the oil prices are low, when oil catches a cold, the helicopter industry catches the flu. Uh, they shut down these oil rigs and there's a lot less need for helicopter transport. Uh, Medivac is kind of considered the plum job. That's my friend Marcus. Uh, he trained at East Coast Aero Club and now he's, uh, hangs, he does 12 hour shifts at a volunteer fire station and he, he, does, he gets paid uh, in North Carolina and uh, goes hospital to hospital or sometimes picks people up off of highways and stuff. So what can you do? You can fly low and slow, uh, both legally and safely. You saw there was a carve out for helicopters able to fly lower. Uh, one problematic aspect of flying Piper Warriors and Cessnas is that people, their expectations of what an aircraft is and what it can do has been set by their airline experience. And the first time you try to get up and use the bathroom in your Piper, you'll discover that JetBlue has some advantages in the aircraft department. And your passengers will notice this too. This is noisy, it's not climate controlled, there's no bathroom. Uh, the helicopters are awesome because people usually haven't even been in one. So it's a whole different experience, it's a different view. Uh, you can take them on a 10 minute ride from Hanscom Field and go back. You don't have to say, oh, let's go have lunch in Martha's Vineyard. You just take them on a little tour and they say, wow, this is awesome. So when I actually want to show people what GA is like and what my world is like, I usually take them for a helicopter ride. I don't take them for a trip. You know, the Cirrus is for transportation. Uh, and the helicopter is really what I think of as the kind of aviation dream that people had you know, in ancient Greece. Like they didn't dream of going to LA in f six hours. Uh, they dreamt of you know, soaring like a bird. Um, you can land off airport. That's where a lot of the challenge comes from the helicopter. You know, people think you're a pilot of heroic skill if you take off and land at Hanscom. That's not very challenging. It's not really that different. And in some ways it's easier than landing, uh, taking off and landing in a Piper or a Cessna. Uh, when you're off airport, you have to exercise a lot of judgment, a lot of skill, um, and that's part of your uh, training, uh, but it's also where people get in trouble, you know, hitting obstacles and stuff. Uh, if you do get all of your airplane uh, skills, you can transfer them over to helicopters very easily. It's 30 hours minimum of additional training to add a helicopter rating. 40 is probably a good budget number. All right, are there, uh, are there helicopter questions? Um, so you mentioned that like, you can land uh, not in your airport, so who regulates that? Like, can you just pick some field and say, okay, here it is, or like, who's going to tell you that you have permission to land? That is a great question. Uh, you know, is there any regulation about where you can land your helicopter? Um, the answer is, you know, until about five or 10 years ago, there wasn't any. So it was just permission of the property owner and, you know, don't do anything careless or reckless. So basically the whole world was open to helicopter pilots. Uh, there is a little bit of a tweaking of the law. The FAA passed this, uh, they added, added this regulation that I think was intended for airplanes, but they forgot to carve it out. Uh, so they said if you make more than 10 takeoffs and landings in the same place in a year, then you have to get it approved as an airport with a huge amount of uh, regulation. I think it was intended for you know, like mining companies that would set up their own landing strip. Uh, it doesn't really make sense. So for helicopters, like if you have a construction site that you want to regularly visit, now it's a bit of a hassle because that 11th landing, in theory, you needed to get approval as an airport. But as a first approximation, you can land anywhere that the uh, property owner is uh, happy to host you. Oh, and, and towns also, like they've, they've, they're really aggressive about harassing people who try to you know, have a helipad at their house now, just because they can. They, they get them under zoning laws, even though they're not really supposed to. The FAA is supposed to have exclusive authority to regulate aviation, because think about it, there's all this, you know, there's so many levels of government in the US, if you let them all, just forbid activities, they would, you know, eventually there would be nothing that was legal at all. Because people in, you know, Concord and Lexington would say, well, we don't want airplanes flying over our heads, so we'll just make it illegal to fly a Gulfstream in Concord. <laughs> um, one more question. 
how, how do the costs differ from flying like a single engine airplane to this? So you know, I, I had that in the earlier slide on learning to fly. Uh, the marginal cost is about double. Uh, you know, so it goes from 150 an hour uh, to 225 or 100 an hour to 200 um, because so many rotating components get discarded after 2200 hours. So the transmissions, the um, blades, and so forth. So it is more expensive per hour. However, like I also said, the flights tend to be a lot shorter. So I would say as a hobby overall, it's about the same cost because you're not dragging people all the way to the Vineyard or Bar Harbor. You're just taking them into Boston and back out, which is about you know, 20, minute of, 20 minutes of flight time and 30 minutes of uh, engine running time. Whereas you know, an intro airplane flight, it would be an all-day thing. You'd probably fly a couple hours, two or three hours. So you'd, you'd actually probably spend more with the airplane. That's a great question. All right, so I guess we should take a 10 minute uh, restroom break. And after that, we're going to hear from Laz about the F 22.